The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24-JACOB. That's 844-24-JACOB. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason along with Sue Kalinske, Sue Ballou, great guest today, Ron Nicewater, who is the creator and writer and producer of Fellow Travelers on Showtime, which is just it's my favorite show at the moment on TV, Sue. I'm right with you, Steve. Excellent. So, uh, you know, we love awards. Actually, before I do awards, let me let me have a personal moment here. So, Sue, I can talk about things on the podcast that I can't talk about in real life. And by real life, I mean on the radio. So um, I, as you know, uh, have, was diagnosed bipolar one all the way back in 2000. It was when we were working together in New York. Mm-hmm. And so everybody knows about this, right? The depression that comes by. And, I, you know, thankfully, uh, because I've got a, a great uh, psychiatrist and all that stuff, psychologist on top of that. I, I handle it really well. What's going on now is the other part of the equation that doesn't get talked about. It's when you go high. So right now I'm feeling a little manic. It's fun to feel high. Like mm-hmm. I've, this is my seventh show this week. We did, uh, three podcasts and five radio shows. So, but I'm, I'm powering right through it. And it's partly because I'm running at a little higher clip than I normally would be, especially for this time of year. I could see it in your eyes. Can you really? <laughs> a little bit. What, what do you see? No, it's just that a lot of times when you're talking right now, your eyes are widening. Oh, see, see, yeah. I'm very excited. So I've done some stupid things over the years when I was uh, manic or on the high side. One of them was when I shattered my foot uh, when I was doing TV back in the 90s. And there was a high bar on the set and I decided I could jump over the high bar um, and I took my shoes off to do it, ended up shattering my foot. So had I not been running high, I don't think I would have been able or I would have attempted that jump but because i was sailing a little bit high at that moment i was like yeah sure i can jump over it and look what i did to myself look what i did to myself no so, go ahead go, go ahead no okay so what I, what i was saying is that you know so i know you're on you so you take medication yes you have therapists and you have a whole team of people working with you <laughs> yes so is is the medication supposed to keep you even so, cause like when you, when you get to your high, high, do you brace yourself for the, 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 the dip? That's a good question. So, you know, generally speaking, if you're watching on YouTube, this is better, but generally speaking, most people operate within this sort of range, right? In other words, it's a little high, a little low, a little high, a little low. With uh, bipolar one, you swing wildly from high to low, high to low. And the point of the medication, um, and is to keep you within a certain normal range. Like you can have a normal bad day and a normal great day, but never are you going to have the most spectacular day in history and the worst day of my life. Like it's eliminating the super highs and the super lows. So, and I'm doing a, a new um, endorsement. I'm working with the LA County Department of Mental Health um, for a new campaign, just reminding people that there are lots of resources uh, and, and ways that you can get help and referrals and all that kind of stuff through the LA County Department of Mental Health. So I'm excited to be able to talk about that. Um, this is pretty specific to me, so I'm not necessarily going to do this uh, subject on on the radio, but they're basically giving me two minutes to say anything I want about mental health, mental health awareness, seeking help, all that stuff. And I'm doing it every Friday. They're calling it uh, the Mason moment of mindfulness. And I'm doing like two minutes on mental health and it's the holidays and people get depressed or lonely 
uh, all that stuff, anxious to see family and friends, um, all that stuff. So I'm doing that endorsement right now, which I, which is really in line with, with my values. But I thought I'd share that because if you're watching, if you're listening and you deal with mental health issues, believe me, the most important thing you can do is go tell somebody right now. So I'm basically telling all you guys. What That's I'm, great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. You know, there's, um, I guess they do do it in, in the States and it's something that I was trying to get involved with, with my friend Ed Krasnick, who's been on the show. Sure. He's done a lot of stuff with comedy and mental, uh, awareness. Yes. And there are groups of people in Australia. I think it's probably the one place where they're doing it the most. Right. Where they have comedy shows and after the show and, and I guess all the comedians that are on the show, are dealing with issues in one way or another. Right, right. And then afterwards, they do a Q&A, and then they have professionals. Um, there's literature. So Really? Yeah. It, it's so, it's such a, just a loving, smart, and it, and it opens it up. And, you know, like someone like you, who's successful and on the radio and, and, um, speaking out about something to show people that, you know, it, ha it hits everyone. Yeah, it does. It and, does. And, and, and it, and you really, really can, um, manage it. So actually, this is a somewhat related question. Are comedians, you said there are comedians involved in this. Are comedians generally, uh, I, and I use this word, you know, casual, but a little crazy. In other words, are they up and down? There's a reputation that comedians, have hit, you know, just like hit rock bottom emotionally all the time. Is that true? I think a lot of comedians, I mean, I, and, but I, I would say, you know, a lot of entertainers. I mean, look at, you know, look at a lot of the creative people that have committed suicide. Yeah, I know. You know, musicians. Know. Um, so comedians, yes. And, um, and, and that's why I think that they're, uh, and I, I think that's why it was created because the people who put it together realized, wow, there is a large population of us who really uh, need help. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's important to talk about, especially at this time of year. I mean, people get bummed at this time of year. Not everybody likes Christmas. Not everybody's into the holidays. Are you into the holidays? Um, yeah. I mean, I um, you know, I'm not a bah humbug kind of person about it. I mean, I, you know, growing up Jewish, you know, Hanukkah. Yeah, yeah. Hanukkah was 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 a little bit of a dud, you know, because um, you know I, I don't know I don't even know if we were talking about it on the show, but you know it's like the eight days of Hanukkah, it's like it, it, yeah I think we were when we were talking about toys recently. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So there wasn't there wasn't a lot of hoopla with Hanukkah. You know, Christmas is kind of like always seemed like it, it it was an American holiday. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was a holiday for everybody. You didn't have to be Jewish. I don't know anybody who celebrates Hanukkah if they're not Jewish. <laughs> that is true. I don't that know people who light a menorah and spin a dreidel, you know, <laughs> you know if they're Italian. You know yeah, what I mean? Right, right. Now, do you put up a Christmas tree now? We actually do. And, and I light a menorah. Oh, you do? You do both? Mm -hmm. You're double dipping on the holidays. I double dip. Yeah. And when do you put your Christmas tree up? Um, I, you know, there's no set time. You know, we put lights up too. Do you have lights up now? <laughs> no, Tom hasn't. <laughs> See, well, my, Tom has my, been very, very busy. Okay. So. so my family is like all in on Christmas all the time. So my mom mm -hmm. put her, if she had her way, not stepdad Leo will not let her put them up too early. She likes them to be up for Thanksgiving. But, uh, they've waited until like, uh, a week after Thanksgiving to put them up. But my brother has his house completely decorated. My mom has her house completely decorated. And I realized, you know what it is? It's that, like, again, this is another moment of honesty thing. So when I was a kid, my dad was just a pain in the ass, like was out all night, never could find the guy. He was always in a bar, all that kind of stuff. And this was the one time of year, the holidays were the one time of year where my dad would come home. He'd hang out with us. Uh, we, he'd play with the toys with us. He'd be part mm. of decorating the tree. So for us, it was the happy time. And we were looking to extend that for as long as we possibly could. That's why all the Christmas stuff goes up really early in my family. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, totally. 
totally. Now, would he would he drink at home during the holiday, like little eggnog with little something something in it? No, just beer. Just my dad would plow through a case of beer like it was nobody's business, which I never understood. Like beer is such a slow way to get drunk. So much slower than liquor, especially the beer back then. Like there, there's, there's beers now, like craft beers. Right. That, that, I mean, the alcohol content is like, you know, 12, 15%. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that's why Christmas and oh, and the other thing, you know, we love award shows. Um, the first awards of the season have been handed out. They are the Gotham Awards. Did you read about this? I did not. Okay. So the Gotham Awards, uh, happened earlier this week. Apparently it aired on Apple Plus. I didn't know that. I would have watched. Don't tell, uh, don't tell me if the, jo- if the Joker won. If the Joker. No, Gotham. I think. Oh, it was Gotham. Batman. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Joker never wins, by the way. Uh, yeah. th- thankfully. So, uh, here are just some nominees. And here's the thing. We haven't seen virtually any of these. So I'm just going to rattle them off. Uh, best picture, something called Passages. Past Lives, which I'm going to watch this weekend, it stars Greta Lee. It's available for rent on Apple or Prime. Uh, a movie called Reality, a movie called Showing Up, and then one called A Thousand and One. This is what I think is interesting. They've got their nominees for Best Lead Performance and Best Supporting Performance, but they've done that thing where they've combined all the actors and actresses into one category. So they've got 10 actors and actresses up for best lead performance. Uh, Of course, at the Oscars, they still have best actor, best actress. How do you feel about combining everybody into one big 10-person category? I don't like it. Because? I don't know. It just, you know, I, 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 I like that it is the way it is and that that's the way it's, it's kind of been. And, Sometimes when they, when something is changed just to kind of like go off the beaten path, I, I, I don't, I don't know why, you know, I don't know why they do it. Do they so, do it because they just, they're streamlining and just putting, you know, because no, you know, I think they're doing it because the, if the, if the category is acting, men and women both act. So is there really a difference between a man's performance and a woman's performance. They're both performances. So why not put them into one category? Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I know that it's politically correct to say actor, whether you're a woman or a man these days, like there are, there are women that, that consider themselves just actors. Right. I actually use that all the time. Yeah. That, uh, that yeah. Uh, women are actors also. I guess, you know, it's, and I guess like with comedians, you know, I never like being called a comedian. You know, right. it's like, I'm a comedian. Right. Yeah, comedian. I, who, hap- who happens to be a woman? But yeah. I'm a comedian, yeah. just like this guy over here is. So right. Yeah. So it didn't. Now here's why I don't like it: fewer awards. Oh right. Yeah. You know, so all of a sudden you've got one award for best lead performance instead of uh, two awards for best lead performance. So that's uh, that's one of the reasons I don't like it. Um, and I, there's a little bit of get off my lawn here, but it's just always been this way. And I just don't want it to change. I know. That's how I feel. You yeah. know, it's like weird to not it's have like you and the baseball rules. supporting it. Yeah. With the baseball rules. Yes, definitely. You'd like to uh, lengthen the games again. And then Brian Cranston was the one who said he, he made fun of me yes. when I was talking about the rules. And he said, Sue, get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you had something. So, you know, you were talking about, um, doing things, uh, that, uh, that got you in a little trouble, like when you hurt your, your leg and, you know, and, and I was thinking about like, as I get older, um, there are certain things that I would never try for the first time. Okay. Like, like I wouldn't like I skied like a long time ago for a, a very short period of time. And I came into skiing very late, okay. probably in my forties. Got it. Um, but at like the age of 70, I wouldn't just try to ski. Um, I wouldn't, I don't bungee jump now. I wouldn't try to do it. Oh, come on. The, you would do it. No, I wouldn't. And I, I, and I certainly wouldn't do it at the age of 70. So, uh, a Ugandan woman, 70 years old. Yep underwent in vitro. What? 
Yes. And she's, I guess, went on the record as being the oldest mother. She um, had, and she had twins at the age of 70. Oh my God. And, you know, she was quoted as saying how my man left me, you know, he, ever since that she had the kids, he left. And I was like, uh, no shit. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, 70. I mean, I, I just feel like it's really irresponsible on so many levels. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I understand. Oh, I've always wanted a kid. Right. But, you know, the, the ship has sailed. You know, well, or it's, has it? I mean, I don't know, but it's like it's not natural. It's not natural, and I mean, how much longer are you going to be around? Yeah, you may not see this. These kids get out of kindergarten, and I just think, you know, then what happens to the kids? You know, I mean, I don't know how many you know family members she has. I don't know if she has younger siblings or if they're you know if she's thought about that. Right. But I think it's irresponsible for uh for for doctors, you know, as, as, as much as I feel like it's irresponsible when doctors, you know, continue to do cosmetic surgery on somebody who's already past the point. Right. You believe it should be like a bar, like I'm cutting you off. Exactly. A You've after that too filler much. and after that Botox and after that. Too much. Thing. It's like, oh, just one more, just one more. Uh-uh. Right. So you're, you're done, you know? So yeah, I just. It, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, like, what's the cutoff age? Like Janet Jackson, I think she was 50 when she had a baby uh, by in vitro. Now, is that within the cutoff range? I think 50. I think, like, because I, I know of, you know, I know of someone who, who had a kid at 50. But I remember years ago when I was doing stand-up, who was it, Adrienne Barbeau? I know she yeah. had a kid at, like, 60-something. Did she and, really? Yeah. And I was like, what, you know, what is the advantage? I mean, that you're both in diapers at the same time. <laughs> it's like, what, what, why? Why? I mean, and, and I have friends that like adopted kids late in life. Right. And I just, you know, it's not, I mean, the, it's, it's not the cycle of life that we've, you know, naturally got. And I don't want to, I don't want to sound like judgy about it, but I just feel like, oh, it's too late. You you do sound judgy about it. Yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel bad for the kids. Well, you know, 60, what, how old are you? 60? 66. 66. So you're almost ready to have a baby. I'm almost ready. <laughs> you, you, you waited. <laughs> it's like if someone says, what are you waiting for? And it's like, I have four more years. Yeah, exactly. You've got plenty of time. All right. Uh, here we go. Our guest today was an Academy Award nominee for Best Original Screenplay for Philadelphia. He's also written films like The Painted Veil, My Policeman, Free Held, and Smithereens. He went on to be a writer and producer for both Ray Donovan and Homeland. His latest project is as creator of Fellow Travelers, a limited series for Showtime starring Matt Bomer and Jonathan Bailey. It is my favorite show going on TV at the moment. Ron Nicewanner joins us. Ron, thanks a lot for coming on, man. Really my pleasure, Steve and Sue. Uh, so I love this show. I mean, I've never seen anything like it on TV. It's very open about gay life during the 50s and gay life during the 80s. And I love getting to see characters like me on screen. So congratulations on making such a smart and an honest and real life. Uh, I mean, I look forward to this every single week. Great. Right. Well, um, gee, that means a lot. Thanks. It's, um, it's, you know, it's been a, an 11 year long journey for me. Uh, from when I first read Mr. Malin's beautiful book. And, uh, you know, things take a while. They take uh, the time that they take, and it seems to have come together at the right time, I think. And um, and it came together, you know, when, uh, when something works out, it's just a feeling of relief. You know, people say, you must be so proud of yourself. I said, no, I'm just, like, relieved. Like, it all, it all came together. I'm grateful, really grateful. So, um was there ever talk about it being a feature or was it talked about as being a limited series always? Well, you know, it all, uh, I, I sort of did the talking to myself actually for many years, uh, but, um, actually that's not true. The first person who optioned the book for me was, uh, Steve Golan, who used to run anonymous content, who's no longer with us. Uh, so, but, uh, I got distracted with other things. So in my mind, it was always going to be a, a mini series. 
um, I, I, it, I wanted to, uh, I immediately felt very early on that I wanted to expand the story past the fifties and that I felt that that would take time. It's definitely not an ongoing series because you know, you, the ending of the story is really important. So to delay that ending, uh, you know, I, I didn't know how to do that over multiple seasons. So the mini series seemed to be the perfect form. You see, so, because I, is, I, can I just ahead, say sir. one other thing, Steve? Yeah, I'm sorry. Please. Um, because I, I didn't read the book and I didn't know anything about the book. So I didn't know that the book ended where, it, where it, it ended. And I was yeah. thinking, what a luxury to be able to do it as a mini, mini series. Because I know when it's a film, you know, you're limited to a couple of hours, maybe three something hours at most. And you would have to cut certain things from the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I do want to ask you one other thing. Was sure. there anything that you, um, I know you, you added obviously, but is it, were there things that were in the book that you didn't put in the book that put in the, in this, in the miniseries? You know, um, I mean, certainly there are, but it's, but not things that I sort of like, oh, I wish we had done this or that. I love Mr. Mountain's book and, and, you know, it definitely inspired my show and, I was so nervous when we sent him the first two episodes, like, you know, and he, he acknowledges my book is the book and your show is the show. And he's very happy with, with, with that. And they live alongside each other. But I, you know, I, um, Mr. Mallon's book is much more about the politics of the time and sort of, and he's really knowledgeable about backroom politics, you know, and those kind of rough conversations that they have in the back rooms where they're trying to work out their power plays. Um, that I, I I really wanted to take Hawkins Tim to a, a, a not a deeper level, but to a long term a relationship that lasted for many years, and that meant well Hawk got married, didn't he? So yeah. you know that's that's you know Lucy Smith is an invention, the whole Smith family is an invention, and uh, and uh, you know and then where was and then uh, and I knew um, I knew that uh, you know the LGBTQ community faced a very dark time in the 50s and the other dark and i wasn't you know i wasn't around then but uh but but i the other dark time was um the aids crisis of the 80s which i was around for mm -hmm. you know i came out of the closet in 1977 78 oh, so wow. there were just a few years there you know of sort of that freedom i know who i am and i can have these relationships i can have many relationships sometimes at the same time <laughs> you know and that's sort of that 70s sort of disco fueled freedom and then you know the aids crisis and people around you just dropping uh, just dying so um i knew i wanted to bookend the series with that and then i thought well didn't they see each other in between what happened you know did they see each other in 1968 for example which mm -hmm. they do which you'll see this weekend Tonight, actually, you can see the 1968 episode, and 1979 is episode seven. Yeah. So this is first and foremost, at least for me, a love story between Hawk and and Tim, played by Matt Bomer and Jonathan Bailey. And it's against the backdrop of, as you mentioned, the 50s and the Lavender Scare and the 80s and the AIDS crisis. But when I look at it, I think these are two guys who are in love, but they're not actually meant to be together. Does that make sense? It's the yes, and it's the best kind of love story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I personally, I happy love stories. I, I don't. I, that would take about five minutes of my attention. Uh, you know, how boring. Uh, and you know, a perfectly happy relationship. I have to say, how boring. Uh, but uh, so uh, you know, I was inspired. You know, I, I've written about this. Uh, the way we were. You know, it's a movie, you know, yes. that's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And, you know, Streisand and Redford, uh, Katie and Hubble, they're not meant to be together. They love it. They, they're drawn mm -hmm. to each other. She's good for him. And in some ways, he's good for her. But together, it's not going to work. And, you know, and it's tragic and beautiful. And that kind of that tragic love story, I think, is what uh, we have here just since we watch these people struggle. But, you know, what I... I have to say, Steve, you mentioned the Lavender Scare. I'm not sure that everybody watching us might even know what that is. I wasn't sure I knew what it was when I read the book. And that was in time in the 50s when the government literally banned with a federal order all, quote, sexual deviants or morally uh, questionable people from working for the federal government. And in the 50s, post-World War, so many young people moved to D.C. to be part of remaking the world. 
the world needed to be re- Europe needed to be rebuilt after World War II. And they were yeah. there and they were eager and they wanted to make the world a great place. And then they were being sent, given polygraph tests about who they slept with. Mm. And their, their, their neighbors, the FBI went to people's buildings and talked to the neighbors and said, have you seen like a man go into this person's apartment? They wrote letters to people's parents. Imagine wow. your farm couple back in Kansas and the FBI says, your son's being investigated as a sexual deviant. At one point, the, we mentioned this in the show, the, the State Department estimated that they're experiencing one suicide a week. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And so that, that period of history, and what it does with the love story is it raises the stakes. So you, when your life could be destroyed, if someone sees somebody sneaking out of your apartment at 6 a.m., that love has an intensity because you're taking a risk just to be together. And I, I, you know, I, that, that, those high stakes, I think, gives the show its energy. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, that. Um, I, first of all, I just want to talk about writing in general because I've I've written for TV great. and and a, a, a great friend of mine. I know Jimmy, you have. Oh, uh, a great yeah. friend of mine, Jimmy Vallelee, who he, he's worked on so many great sitcoms. And um, Will Arnett was saying that Jimmy Vallelee said the most prophetic thing to him when he was working on Arrested Development. He said, "Writing is talking," mm. and you know. It's, it's, sometimes I'll watch something and it's like, oh God, they're trying a little too hard to say something. You know, yes. this is yeah. not really how people talk, you know? Yeah. And there was that one moment where, um, where Tim is talking to his priest and the priest says to him, if you're sincerely sorry, God will forgive you and make you pure. And he says, that's the problem. When I committed this sin, I felt yeah. more pure than I felt in my entire life. Mm. So, how could I be sorry for that? Yeah. And it just, yeah, that, oh my. That, and let's give Mr. Mallon credit for that because that actually came straight from his book, that, that mm. moment. Uh, you know, Tim struggles uh, with his faith throughout the thing. And we, I, I don't know how many episodes, I don't know if you, you got the whole episode. I have, seen, I've got three seen episodes. Six, seven, and eight? I've got three episodes left. I'm watching it in real I've time. Se- okay. I've seen them all. So. Through Saul. Okay. So, through what we really, I'll talk about two things. Let me go back to your comment about talking or not talking. I, I agree. That's true. But I, but I think sometimes the best writing, Sue and Steve, is in what people don't say. And because of, and I think to write scenes where people break up, but don't ever use the words break up, you know, where they uh, somehow let that person know, I love you, but they can't say the words, I love you. That to me is the better, the best kind of writing where people struggle and hide their feelings. So I, you know, one of the rules that we had in, I had rules, some of those rule guys, like in my writer's room, you know, there were certain words that were not allowed to be invoked. Trigger, trauma, speak their truth. Hmm. I said, I don't want, don't tell me this is when a character speaks his or her truth. I don't believe people speak their truth because we don't know our truth. You know, we're human beings and we're struggling in the dark. And that actually, that, that's the great suck, you know, when someone doesn't even quite know themselves. So mm. they don't quite know what to say in this situation. So I, I like people sort of struggling, you know, as Tim occasionally said, in that moment that you quoted, he, 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 he quote unquote speaks his truth. Mm-hmm. Well, but he isn't saying, therefore I'm done with the church. He's crying when he says that. Right. Yeah. It's not a moment of triumph for him. He's saying, I'm now in a trap. Because I love God and I love my church. I love my faith and I think I love this guy. What am I going to do? And that, that's what I, we always try to do is to see, put people in a dilemma, you know, not have people sort of, they're not kind of characters who figure themselves out very easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, to the, the one thing and I'd speak to the writing again. Um, nothing in the series is on the nose. Uh, like for Good. example, Hawk is kind of a jerk and tim is kind of reckless and emotional and even even the bad guys even they're they're not painted as purely black well i mean mccarthy's a i mean an awful human being but even roy Cohn, who is a terrible heinous human being who i i just despise i felt a little bit of empathy for him when david shine said you know what i'm not like you I was like, you, you could see Cone sort of shrink in that moment. And so I love that 
there are lots of shades and nothing's on the nose in the entire series. Well, you know, here's the great human dilemma is that people who do bad things are human beings. You know, so as soon as any, you know, as soon as we sort of turn somebody into some inhuman monster, we actually have kind of, we've taken responsibility away in, in some ways. So that's, they are, human beings are capable of doing really bad things to each other. So, you know, that I, 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 and I believe that what we were sort of suggesting was the, the thing that really formed Roy Cohn was the moment, Steve, that you just described. Mm-hmm. When this thing that he's tried, he's, I think Roy Cohn loved David Shine. Yep. You know, they traveled together for three years. They always in adjoining suites. I don't think they had a sexual relationship. I think they just, it was, that never got to that point. I think yep. Roy would have loved it, but that didn't go to that point. But that, to me, that really formed Roy Cohn. Then for the rest of his life, you know, that being spurned. And I think he never, I would have guessed he never loved another person again. Uh, so I, a glimmer of humanity is, I think, uh, I appreciate you saw that. You know, I didn't want to do cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, w- I want to talk about sex. It's one of my favorite subjects. Hey, you know, I, I, I've, I've been, uh, I've done a lot of research in that area myself, Steve. So <laughs> <laughs> I was well equipped, so to speak, to, uh, uh, to uh, approach the, the, the sexual content of the show. And the sex between Hawk and Tim is hot. I mean, it just, it just is. Um, and I want to know what the line is between what's gratuitous and what pushes the story forward and then also who on the studio side was like said yeah just just unleash it in terms of the sex well the president of Fremantle studios showtime was the network and Fremantle was the studio uh, dante de loretto said let's make the sex between hawk and tim so hot that straight men watching it will want to have gay sex <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, as, i'm not sure i mean i haven't no straight guys come up to me and said hey hey i started uh, after i saw uh, the hey, show yeah like, like, yeah i'm kind of inspired by your show when i yeah that hasn't <laughs> happened yet uh i'm available um but uh so there was no pushback uh from uh, anybody in, in those offices but here's the thing the pushback came the push came from me and my colleagues Every, every scene in the show and especially every sex scene has to tell a story, has to move the characters forward in some way. And every sex scene is about power. You know, so we had the, again, I'm a guy of rules. So we had, that was the rule on the set. Every sex scene is about power and it, it tells a story. So it wasn't like 20 minutes into an episode. Hey, let's show some skin. Never like that. And the other, we had another rule was that we would never do the same sexual behavior twice. And I have to say, by the time my writers and I got to episode eight, we were like sort of scratching our heads and thinking like, uh, what hasn't gone Are into there any what? moves like, left? What? <laughs> Are there? And uh, there is, actually. Yeah. I'll, you can, I'll, I'll give you something to look forward to. Excellent. Well, I have to say, as a woman watching two men have sex, it was, it, 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 it was just hot sex. I mean, that's really what it was for me. It was no mm-hmm. different than watching something like Body Heat, you know? It was, mm-hmm. it was beautiful. And I appreciated so much that you went there with this because to a man and a woman, it, it's, it's no difference with, with two men mm-hmm. or with two women. It's, it's two mm-hmm. people who love each other, who are just giving themselves over to each other. And that's, and I, and I love that you did that. I yeah. really, really do. Nice. Um, Thank you. And, and one, one thing I want to talk to you about, I get into a lot of minutia when it comes to watching movies and TV shows. Please. Yeah. And Good. one thing that I love that you did it was the ambient sounds. Like there was a scene, and I think it was in the second episode when Tim and Hawk were lying in bed together, and you hear like a faint like tick, tick, tick of an electric clock. I mean, no, of a, of a battery operated clock. Cause I have a battery operated clock in my office. Uh-huh. And sometimes I'd hear it and sometimes I don't. And while they were lying in bed, I heard like a, tss, tss. and there were times where I heard sounds, um, like, like, uh, like voices, uh, coming from another apartment or a faint barking. And there were times where I actually turned down the volume 
to see if it was happening outside my house. And it was good. It was in the show. Yeah. And well, yes. I loved it. It, it just, well, those it, are it all just choices. gives it so much more reality. Well, I had an incredible, my entire crew, uh, we did shot and did posts in Toronto. It was incredible, but including the sound team that no one ever mentions them, actually. So I'm so glad you did. You know, and if you heard a dog barking or if you heard children playing or if you heard a neighbor somewhere or in Tim's apartment, you hear somebody practicing this uh, saxophone, I believe it is. So that is, so just know, and you're, you should know, a conversation was had about that dog barking. Hmm. And, you know, and every time, or the clock ticking, we're sitting there in the mixing stage saying like, wait, 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 can, can we take it to, no, is it too, is it, is it undistracted guys? It's too much. So there, you know, every, 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 I'm glad you noticed those things because nothing is accidental in the show. Because I, I worked on Top Chef and I, you know, when I, when I worked on Top Chef, you know, I would sit when we were doing mixes and, you know, we were always, you know, going through, you know, a little more sizzle coming from the pan, you know, just the little things that most people probably wouldn't even think about, like normal people and people in our, in our field would think about. But it was like, yes, you know, it's like, like if someone's putting a pinch of something and it of hits course. the pan, yeah. you know, you want to, you want to hear it. Well, I, yeah. And I, and by the way, we, had, you and I need to have a sidebar <laughs> coffee, whatever. <laughs> I am obsessed with Top Chef. So I have so many questions for you. It's one of my, it's true. It's tr I'm like passionate. I, I've watched seasons three or four times, like all the way mm. through. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know them all. Like I have my favorite chefs from like season one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so, uh, speaking of the sex, I mean, one of the interesting things that we did was to, you know, when you have, when you see background players, for example, uh, in certain scenes, you know, having sex, you know, we like in the back from bar scene, you know, that they're not actually having sex, obviously. So the sounds aren't there. So we actually had to add those sex sounds. And those are very interesting to do with what we call the loop three. You know, the people right. who come in to fill in voices, crowds and all that kind of stuff. And we, you know, and that it was a really interesting conversation to say like, Okay, see those guys having that kind of sex back there. So, hey, uh, Joe, Pete, you are, you're the passive, you're the active guy. So go to it. You know, and they're in their little sound booth. And then I have to say, after one recording session with them, I said, guys, when you told your parents that you wanted to be an actor, is this what you had in mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's quite. great. So how important was it for you to cast gay actors in the lead roles? A great question. You know, it was important, not a rule. You know, and uh, we, uh, you know, Matt Bomer, uh, who's also an executive producer, uh, was attached to this three years before we got it made. So Matt, you know, Matt's commitment actually really helped draw people in all ways to the project. Um, but we, but we, and as you're casting, you know, you're not allowed to ask and you shouldn't be allowed to ask. You sure. can't, the casting director can't call the agent and say, Hey, is this person LGBTQ? But so we have, but, but my producer, Robbie Rogers, uh, who's, you know, uh, he and Greg Berlanti are, you know, gay. He, he's, he's an out gay soccer player. Robbie was, and he's married to Greg, Greg Berlanti. You know, so Robbie would go on Instagram after we, we were interested in an actor and he'd say, Oh, they follow me. They're gay. <laughs> so that's how we figured out. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, like I'm on their Instagram feed. He's gay. <laughs> that's very uh, funny. So we, so we, we started to have an idea uh, about it. And sometimes in co conversations and after my volunteer, they might sort of say, you know, I really connected to this part because of my experience. You know, but they could bring that up, but we, you know, we couldn't say it. But it was, I, I, I think it a lot gave a comfort to people in the sex scenes because it's not just Matt and Johnny, the other actors had sex scenes and also it gave them a comfort to those and a kind of a shorthand in some ways that we might have had to explain a little bit more to straight actors about that. Um, so, uh, I, and I think moving forward, it'll always be important to me to do that. But again, not a rule. You know, I think it's unfair to say to an actor, you know, you're absolutely great for the part, but you're not, the, you don't, I don't, but who you sleep with rules you out. So, yeah, yeah. So I think it's really important 
I'm going to soapbox this thing a little bit. I, I think it's really important that younger members of the LGBTQ community watch this series because like a few weeks back, I was talking to this kid, uh, who was an intern at uh, the radio station I worked for. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm gay. I came out when I was 15. I'm like, you came out when you were 15. I came out when I was 28. I was so far deep in the closet. It was, um, and it partly was because of the AIDS crisis. It scared the living hell out of me. Um, sure, of I, course. I came out in 19, well, I, I, I was a senior in high school in 1983. And I remember Brokaw being on the NBC nightly news talking about the gay cancer and it just scared the hell out of me. And I don't think yeah. kids, younger members of the LGBTQ community realize that there was a time when you could be, your life could be ruined by the fact that you were expressing uh, your natural sexuality or in the AIDS crisis, what, you know, how, how dangerous it was, uh, to express your sexuality. Um, and I just think it's, uh, and thank God it's gotten easier. Uh, but it used to be really, really hard, right? Well, you know, that's something we talked about a lot on the show, especially with younger actors or, um, younger writers, et cetera. You know, if somebody would say like, Oh, well, I guess I haven't yet discovered my gay identity. I'd say stop right there. In the fifties, there's no such thing. There's yeah. no gay community. You know, there are people that hang out in bars and they're, you know, they, they're having, you know, they, they having sex with people of the same gender and they, they know they're part of a homosexual culture. But, you know, when I was uh, back in uh, coal mine in Pennsylvania, had these weird feelings inside me. I had no words for them. You know, when we, when I pitched the show three years ago, the beginning, the, my, the first part of my pitch was when I was growing up, uh, I, I didn't hear the word homosexual spoken aloud until I went to college. Hmm. Until I was like 19. And that meant to me that what I was feeling inside was not just bad, it was unspeakable. Yeah. I was mm. the un unspeakable thing. There were no gay characters in television, yep. not in movies, not in books. Even more than that, there was no conversation. You never had people like say, hey, like my cousin's gay, I think. Yeah. It, 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 you were, it was unspeakable. To be yeah. what I was, yeah, you know. So that that is something that uh, is really hard, I think, for people now to uh, understand. It. And Steve, to your point, I think I, some journalists have said to me that they, some younger people have said to them from the LGBTQ community, you know, oh, I don't want to see another show about how hard it is to be gay, blah 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 blah. But I I want to say the show is really entertaining. Yeah, it's you fun. Know? And what one of the show presents is. And, and also is that during dark times, people find a way to have sex, to dance, to have a sort of a gay culture, even though in the 50s it was kind of a submerged, very, you know, be, be in drag, you know, have be fabulous, even though the police might raid the bar at any moment and take you away to jail. So our community has found joy, you know, in a weird way through the AIDS crisis. And what do you mean found joy? Well, we solved the AIDS crisis as much as it as solved. That was yeah. the act up and those people working with the CDC, Dr. Fauci, and, you know, fi and finding a way. And they did it joyfully. Their demonstrations were like theatrical and filled with joy. So that's, and I also, when young people say like, this is the, oh, this is the darkest time ever. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Actually, you can get married. See, right. Uh, when I, could you imagine, like, when I was a kid, somebody said, you know, Ron, Two men will be able to go to a justice and peace and get a marriage license. I'd say, are you smoking crack? What, yeah. what are you talking about? That'll never happen. Never. So it's not the darkest time in our history. And no matter what, we can have fun. We can find joy. And that's, and I think the show does have that, you know, in it. I hope. Yeah. No, it absolutely does. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the rest of your career, if that's okay. Please. So you wrote the amazing film, Philadelphia, starring Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington. And yeah. there's one scene in there, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot, but there's one scene in there that is like the scene for me. It's kind of the scene that's the emotional beating heart of the movie. It's also the scene yeah. where I looked at Tom Hanks and said, wow, he's more than, you know, the guy from Bosom Buddies. It's that moment where he's listening to that aria. Um, and the way it's shot, it's like this, 
how did your writing, Jonathan Demi's direction, Tom's performance, how did that all come together to create this, this scene that if you say the movie Philadelphia, this is what pops into my head? Well, you know, um, yeah, thanks. That scene actually is obviously talked about a lot and is very important to me. It happened, uh, by accident in a way. And Jonathan and I were very, very close. And, uh, and one day I was, and I always chose a piece of music, uh, before a project before I would start writing and I'd listen to it. And I'm not an opera fanatic, but Maria Callas for some reason seemed to fit. And I would listen to that aria and I was sitting in my living room and I thought I have, at that time I lived in a house in upstate New York and it was summer and I, I was listening to the aria and it really moved me that particular morning. And I remember I was like getting teary eyed and stuff. And I, and I heard a little knock tap at the door. The, the, the screen porch door was right there. And the guy who mows my lawn, Russell, was standing right there. And I felt incredible shame. Mm. And he was like a great guy. He was like, Ron, he had a question about the yards. He, and I, I said, I said to myself, here you are, this queer guy sitting in your house, crying, listening to opera. You're, you're a total cliche, total shame. Mm. And then it almost simultaneously, I thought, that's an interesting scene. Yeah. Mm. That's an interesting scene. And I literally, and I wrote the scene. And by the way, I just took the, <laughs> the CD and read the aria, the lyrics to the aria yes. and, you know, the, uh, libretto and typed it in and, you know, and wrote the sure. scene and I took it to, I took it down to Jonathan, down to Nyack and he read it and he said, I'm not sure it's fair to do this to people. Is this going to be, is, it, is this a fair thing? I also tell you that that scene, the pushback that we got from, Every, all the studio was enormous. Really? Jonathan, in those days we had faxes, not emails. <laughs> I came to his office. The next time I, we sent in a script, I, I, he had a stack of faxes. He said, I'm going to start reading these to you. Hated it. Hated it. Hated it. Mm. Gay executives hated it. They said, what a cliche. Can't they talk about sports or something? You know, mm. why are they, why is he talking about opera? He, I mean, hated it. It was universally hated. Am I allowed to swear on the show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's reading these to me, and uh, you know, and he says, "Ron, do you like this scene?" I said, "Jonathan, I love the scene." He said, "Yeah, so do I." Fuck them! And he threw the faxes in the trash. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Tom Hanks hadn't signed on yet, but when Tom's when I met when first time I met Tom, he said, "I'm here because of the opera scene." And, you know, now and I have to say when I tell that story. I, if it, I don't know if it still is, but at one point it was listed on AFI's, uh, you know, 25 best scenes. It's amazing. Uh, in, in drama. So, uh, uh, 100 best scenes in American cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, music to me is so crucial, uh, in, in watching film and TV shows. Yes. And yes. Even, even going back just for a second in, in, um, in the series. Your music supervisors, oh my God, the songs that they chose. I mean, there were so many of the songs I'd never heard before. And, you know, um, one of them was Mad About a Boy, uh, Mad About the Boy, yeah. which was, yeah. oh my God. And, and just the placement, yeah. you know, like Great Pretender, yeah. um, just, just incredible. But, but going back to Philadelphia, um, what was your reaction the first time you heard Bruce Springsteen song? Um, well, I'm, you know, a Bruce fanatic. So, uh, you know, I wasn't surprised. It's funny. I, Jonathan, I knew Jonathan was out to him. And I literally, I have to say, I can't remember the first time, but I, I know that Jonathan had gone to Neil Young first, mm -hmm. Neil Young's Philadelphia songs at the end for the opening. And right. Neil wrote a ballad. And John was like, no, Neil, I think it should be like rock and roll. It needs to be up with the opening. And then he went to Bruce and Bruce wrote a ballad. Yeah, he wrote Jonathan just said, he wrote I guess a ballad. the movie's supposed to open with a ballad. Like if Neil and Bruce, that's what they think. So I love both those songs. And I um and thanks for bringing that up. And you know, Jonathan is my gave me my life. So I owe so much to him. And, you know, but I but I want just want to say to our music, I'm I I hope that people listen to the songs that play at the end credits. I'll tell you why. Every song that we at every episode ends with a song by somebody who an LGBTQ artist who died of AIDS. Oh, wow. Oh, Except for Mark Heitzel. Episode two ends with a song by Mark Heitzel, who's 
thankfully still with us. Yeah. But he, but he was writing about a friend who died of AIDS. Mm. So Freddie Mercury, Stephen Grossman, uh, Arthur Russell, um, Sylvester. Yeah. Pause know me. So mm-hmm. every song, so that was, and I have this genius, Michael Perlmutter, the music supervisor, who was able to find those songs mm. for me. And, and I'll say, I think our score is also incredible by Paul uh, Leonard yeah. Morgan. Incredible. So, uh, Ron, I tried to find a copy of your memoir. Oh, yeah. It's there. You can't find it, right? Blue Days, Black Nights. I came up empty. I tried, I tried everywhere to find it, but you've been pretty frank about sort of life right after Philadelphia. So this is a big question. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, please describe what happened, uh, during that period, that post Philadelphia period. And also, can you loan me a copy of your memoir? I'm not going <laughs> to loan it to you, Steve. I'm going to, I'm going to bring you one and sign it. Very nice. Thank you. Um, can I, can I piggyback on that? Yeah. I, if I have, it's funny, I'm down to, I might have one. You might have to share it. Uh, okay. Okay. And we're trying to get it reissued, by the way. So that, this will be, a, I'm going to, I'm going to call my book agent right now. Um, what happened was, you know, I was, during Philadelphia, I, I was falling into drug addiction and alcoholism. I actually, there was one night while we were shooting Philadelphia that I came very close to being arrested on the streets of Philadelphia mm. in the middle of production, you know, uh, the, uh, in the middle of somebody handing me some substance wow. and then the undercover police coming and me like running. Uh, and it just, Philadelphia, it, you know, it's, it's not like success went to my head. I, 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 I spent most of my life in upstate New York. I, I, I didn't live some big glamorous life, but I definitely had it from that period on the, the F94 through 99. I just sank and sank and sank, you know, struggled uh, until in 1999, you know, and that, uh, I was, I was ready, uh, to, I was willing, uh, to find help. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's, it was, so that was a period of where I wasn't, and people were coming to me and, you know, I, I had so many opportunities to write so many things. So I, you know, I messed a lot of them up. I went to meetings, high on crystal meth, mm. you know, and was saying like, oh, is your air conditioning broken? You know, trying to like cover the fact that wow. I was sweating mm. at the toe. Uh, and, you know, those days have been, uh, uh, those days ended 24 years ago. And, uh, I'm, and, uh, my life has turned around. So that's what happened. And in that period, I also had, a, fell in love with somebody who shared my, which is what my memoir is about is, is my love, my tragic, literally tragic, cause he's no longer with us. Love affair with uh, uh, a man who, uh, it was hard to sort of hold on to. Hmm. 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 So and by the way, sobriety hasn't stopped that happening. Good. <laughs> Nor should it. <laughs> Nor should that it. It hasn't stopped that yet. Yeah. yeah. So here's something weird. I worked on a movie called Monkey Shines in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, directed by George Romero uh, as a production ah, assistant. George, yeah. And after yeah. it was over, I was offered a job on a movie called Prince of Pennsylvania. And oh my God. Instead of uh, working on Prince of Pennsylvania, I came to LA to pursue my show business dreams. But you were the writer and the director of Prince of Pennsylvania. So I, I always yeah. I'm thinking now I, we almost work together. Uh, what's it like wow. to jump from writer to director? You know, it's funny though. That's, it, it was fun. And actually, um, it, it, the showrunner being a writer, creator, showrunner in television is similar to being a writer, director and uh, features because in television, and why I like to prefer television to features, why I'm probably only going to do television from now on is that, you know, even, uh, even if you're not the showrunner, the writer is, has creative authority. So writers of television episodes, you know, we produce our own episodes. We're on the set for our episodes. And then the showrunner, you're the ultimate creative authority. You know, you work, you collaborate with everybody. So, and again, it's not like, oh, I'm the guy in power, but you know, the pleasure of when I talk to you about, you know, I selected the songs that we, I just talked about. I worked with the composer and just sort of like write a script and send it away and ha- let someone else have all that fun. I'm not going to do that again. No, I want to, I, I want to sit with the sound guys and say like, that dog is barking too loudly. Like tone that down <laughs> because it's fun. And you're collaborating with a hundred plus people every day to make a television show is just, it's one of the great, it was one, fellow travelers is one of the great joys of my life. You know, Philadelphia was too, but Jonathan and I were so close. And I was with Phil, on Philadelphia set every day, and 
we were absolutely you brothers in spirit. So that that I didn't feel removed from the process as you do in other writers sometimes are removed from the production of memories for whatever right. reason. And uh, it's just the an experience I'm going to have again. Yeah. Well, the TV thing, like when I when I, I I started in scripted and then I got involved in reality and I worked on my first big reality show was the Osbournes. And at that time, wow. there were no production companies. There was no middleman. So it was MTV yeah. and then us. We were we were all, you know, yeah. and, and people don't like this expression, but basically the inmates ran the asylum. And uh-huh. um, I worked in I worked yeah. in post. So um, yeah. I sat and worked with the editors and produced episodes with them. So yeah. there was one moment where we couldn't find a song that dictated what the, the, the scene that, that we had cut. So my editor uh, was played guitar and wrote. So the two of us actually wrote a song together and we pitched it to our executive producer Fantastic. And I don't even think like the, 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 the higher ups at MTV, yeah. they had no idea what we were doing yeah. and, and it got into the show. So that's yeah, something right. that probably never would happen today because there were just too many people, too many cooks in the yeah. kitchen. Then yeah. it was the most pure creativity I ever experienced yeah. in my career. Yeah. You know, so that's beautiful. And I will have, I will say that, you know, I was, uh, obviously I developed the script with Showtime. Uh, Gary Levine, uh, was the president of Showtime while we were developing it. Gary and I go back to 2003. I wrote a movie called Soldier's Girl for them, which is one of the very early trans movie about a, a tra- with the trans. Oh, by the way, that is a character. great movie. That is a great movie. I, I just yeah, remembered I, it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel a little bit pioneering. I, I don't think you know, transparent was not, the, you know, like I, I was there before. I just, I just want to. Set the record straight there, you know, uh, writing about transgender issues. But, um, uh, you know, Gary and I had a relationship, but, and obviously there, there were notes, but I, with Gary and with my other executives, I said notes and notes. You know, I actually was sometimes presented with notes and said, take this with a grain of salt. So I was up in Toronto. They, uh, I, we made the show that we thought was the great show. With their help. I mean, their notes are sometimes actually really smart and really good and really helpful. You know, and with their support, I'm not saying I did it by myself. I'm saying this Bell Travelers was given, there, there was a, a development of trust with us. With, and we, myself, Robbie, Van Minahan, Matt, all the other, we made the show that we wanted to make. So there's nothing in it that I watch and say, Oh, I wish the studio hadn't made me do that. I'm embarrassed. Not, and if there's anything in the show that I don't, I'm not happy with. Uh, you know, I look in the mirror. You know, I'm the guy who did that. It's, it was it is a beautiful experience. So you bring up Gary Levine. I worked with my first writing job was with Gary Levine. He was at the WB when I worked on, <clears throat> excuse me, a show with Joey Lawrence and his brothers called Brotherly Love. Oh yeah, sure. Wow. And Gary. I didn't know much yeah. about Gary's other life, but I went to I went to Temple during the high holidays many years later, and he's he was a cantor and with or, an or incredible right? voice. Yeah, uh, unbelievable, and I'm like, yeah. oh my god, he was my yeah. executive at at Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Garrett, you know, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing for for years to be getting notes from somebody, and you know, and uh, and it felt, you know, there was one, uh, a couple notes. Uh, I I looked you know, in the Zoom thing. I'm saying, really, Gary? Really? <laughs> a fellow child, as he said, yes, really, yeah. <laughs> And a couple of nights I did, and I said, oh my God, you, got, you were so right. Helpful that I did. And said, Gary, I, there was one particular where I said, I did what you asked. I'll, I'll send you the cut, but I hate it. I mean, I really hate it. Wow. And they said, don't do it. Mm-hmm. And that, I, you know, that developed, we had developed a trust where if I was literally saying I hate something, he, 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 he trusts me. I, there was also another moment where they, moment where they asked to cut something, a line. I said, that is the line from the novel that when I read it made me want to do the show. And Gary said, okay, Ron, leave it in. But you know, you can only say that once. <laughs> so the next time I want to cut a line, you can't say that that's the line. You, you, you use that one up now. So you get this one. You know, I found with great executives and people, they love, you go to these festivals and the people love telling the stories about how I fought and fought the stupid executives to get my art made. That's not, 
my experience. You know, I've had executives uh, who are my partners. You know, we're trying, all trying to do the same thing, which is make a great television show. So I, I uh, Gary, among many others, Jeff Steer, Dave Vinegar, Amy Israel, Showtime, Dante DiLoretto, uh, at Fremantle, they were, they were my partners in this thing. And it, it's a, uh, I'm really grateful. I, I want to share something with you. I think you'll get a kick out of. So when I was working on Talk Chef, you know, they did the after show on Andy Cohn's show. Okay. I know. Okay. So I know um, everything about Top Chef. Uh, so <laughs> so yeah, I think. one of after one of the quick fire uh, 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 moments, uh, the guy who won, we asked him, "What are you going to do with the money?" And he says, "I'm going to get a hooker and an eight ball." All right. <laughs> and Rich. I wanted to put it in the episode, and the executive producer at Bravo um, said, "No, yeah, you can't put it in." And I said, "Dave." Put it in. You can, you have to put it in. It came out. It was so pure and so funny. You have to put it in. And he <laughs> and he let me put it in. And then in the after show, the guy uh, was talking about that moment, and he said, "Thank you very much, whoever worked on the show, for putting it in." Because when I said it, my eight year old niece said, "What's a hooker and an eight ball?" <laughs> so then he wow. didn't want it in. <laughs> yeah. Well, he well. Yeah, he didn't want it in, but it was such I, a great. I'm dying to know who response. it was. Oh I'm, God, I'm I'll, I'll have to. I have to go back and, and, uh, and figure it out. out. Okay, I'd love to know. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Last movie I want to ask about is My Policeman, which uh, came out this last year with uh, okay. Harry Styles. He's an unbelievably charismatic performer. I saw him at uh, the Kia Forum, and he was. I mean, he puts on a show. Um, but this was one of his first film roles. What was he like as an actor? Did you direct him? differently because he was inexperienced or was he just like a natural? You know, Steve, I was, again, I, w I wasn't there. A, it was, it was COVID and B, I was developing fellow travelers. So I, uh, I, I think I met Harry once after the film was made. So I have, I, I can't really answer any question about, about what happened on the set of my policeman. You know, I, I, I think everyone who worked with him thought he was a great guy and they enjoyed him very much. Do you think this show, Fellow Travelers, will open the door to more LGBTQ stories told in such a, a frank manner? Well, that's a really hard question to answer because, you know, uh, the future, you know, this, this isn't the first time in my long career that people around me are having these conversations. But, you know, we're talking about what is the future of television now? There was an article in the New Yorker College, you know, the end of prestige television, that era. People are saying that era, like going back to the Sopranos to now, that that door is now closed. Mm. Some people, but, but some of my colleagues on fellow travelers say, maybe we just got in under the wire. Like may, we maybe mm. we're the last like really complicated adult show. Why do, you think that, say, why do you think that is? I think people are worried uh, about the conglomeration, you know, that that things are sort of being put into larger and larger, being folded into larger companies, and right. then, you know what 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 their priorities might be. I mean, so that so to predict the future, my experience is is that every three years the business changes in some way. So I've had a long career because I, you know, I can I I'm I'm not rigid. I'm not like okay, I'll you know I'll do this and I'll do that. So, um, I think, and with the, with the uh, post strikes and the, you know, just the, the prevalence of streaming and everybody moving to streaming, you know, we, people just don't know how that will affect the, you know, the decisions made about what pleases the audience. Are we always right. going to go for, or are we now start going for the absolute largest audience possible, which means everything has to be perhaps in some people's minds, you know, dumbed down a little bit. So I'm going to tell you something. That I've learned because I'm not a social media guy, although I have, I, I opened up my Instagram account, which used to be just for like all the like nieces and nephews and things in my life. Like I'm checking on my friends and their babies, but now I opened it up. So now, you know, a lot of people now are, are following me in, uh, cause I talk about the show and I do go in and I read the fans, you know, the real, fa the fans that like are there over and over again and they're smart. I mean, there, there, there are some fans that I, and I, I write to them. You know, I just say like, I'll just send either a message or just in a comment. So I say, yes, you got it. 
you do understand what was going on in that scene. So I think sometimes we, the mistake is made that things have to be simpler, blander. They have to be bland to have the largest possible audience. You know, I, I'm hoping that there will continue to be an audience for, for things where the audience, uh, has to sort of participate. In other, because I think in fellow travelers, if you're on, if you're texting and you're cooking and you're doing, I think he might come back to it like two, three scenes later and say, "What, what, what's happening?" Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Know, or succession. If you think about succession. You know, like the sh- like you know you you can't like walk in and out of the room and follow those shows. You know, so is that that's that's is that you know are we going to continue to want those shows where you sit you know like with the Sopranos, like with Mad Men, with you know the shows that we love, you know uh, that you sit and you watch. Because you're engaged, yeah. You know? And I'm hoping, I'm hoping. But your your question was specifically about LGBTQ characters. You know, Paramount has said, you know, moving forward with Showtime that their LGBTQ themed shows is one of their three. They're like these three areas that they want to continue to develop. So I think that's a, a really beautiful thing. Yeah, you know, that they've made that a, co- a corporate mission. You know, to continue to, I think they call it diverse worlds or something like that. They had a, they had a heading for it. And I was very, um, encouraged when I saw that. So, I, and Steve and Sue, you both know what matters is a good story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you walk in the door, you know, and it used to be, you would say like, Hey, I have this guy, and, you know, I want to do this thing. This detective, he's gay. It used to be people would say, well, well, why is he gay? Now, not even like they were saying, I don't want gay characters. They'd say, well, like, what is it like? And, you know, you wanted to say, like, if he is straight, would you say, why is he straight? Like, he's right. (laughs) Like, like, do we have to, it doesn't have to now be, I, I, I doesn't now have to be about the oppression of homosexuals, which by the way, on the set, I I would say to everybody, do not talk to me on homophobia. Don't talk to, we're not doing your, the oppression story. Mm-hmm. You know, we are, these people lived and loved. They were oppressed, but it wasn't the sum of who they were. Your character is not, I'm an, I'm oppressed. That is not a description of a character. And I think maybe we've moved past that. You know, I love that Hawk is a gay anti-hero. People yeah. write like, God, that Hawk is ruthless. He's, yeah, he's ruthless. I had a director, Destiny, who directed Block 2, episodes 3 and 7, who is very different from Hawkins Full. Like she's 40, she's a black woman, she's, lives it she's straight she lives in london and when i said destiny why do you want to be part of the show and she said i love hawkins fuller i <laughs> love him i want to be him i want to be beautiful have beautiful beautiful plates wear great clothes have sex as much as i want and not care about anything i <laughs> said you're hired <laughs> Got the sex, she would after after a take of something she said i love her you know so it's interesting how you know, there's something about that, I, 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 that we can now have a gay character who is ruthless. Yeah. Icon. Yeah. Tough. Uncaring. You know, it hurts people. And we're still, we're, you know, it's not, it's not saying something about his gayness. It's just, right. it's, you know, it's just part of who he is. Right. Well, right. Right. Uh, listen, I, I, I so appreciate getting to meet with you and talk with you and i'm I'm such a huge fan of the show the show fellow travelers on showtime is my favorite show hands down wow. in a really long time on television it's beautifully complex and the character and it, it makes me feel you know good that this is on screen and i mean i just absolutely love it so thank you thank you very much for coming on and congratulations on the show and i can't see Thanks. how it uh how, can't wait to see how it turns out with uh hawk and tim well yeah um mm-hmm. they don't mm-hmm. get married and ride into the sunset let's say that yeah I, um, I, and you know thank you guys so much it's been so much fun steve uh more of this i, I i'm gonna i'm gonna get to a book and Sue, when we have to have that top tough conversation, you have to okay. think of that person's name. I and, will. You know, but I actually, cause I, to know what was going on in the back, you know, actually going like, was it a real quick fire? Did they really have to do it in 45 minutes? I mean, I want to ask you all those questions. <laughs> the not awesome. so quick, quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> it looked, took four hours to shoot. <laughs> Ron, this they is awesome. Like they're sweating. Th- thank this you, man. This has been, this you. has been awesome. 
Okay, let me know what you see when you get to see uh, to the end. Uh, let me know what you think of the how we ended the show. I will absolutely drop you a note, Ron. Okay, thanks, right, man. Right. Thanks Thank so you much, guys. What a pleasure. All right, there you have it, Ron. Nice one. Or in, oh god, this show, this this show is so good. Um, I like when we're, we're working on some of the actors uh, to come on to the show as well. If you haven't seen this thing, it's a history lesson. Uh, it is emotional it's a love it's got everything in it sue i have such a crush on that bummer <laughs> now but i say i have such a crush on jonathan bailey oh my god you know who he um matt reminds me of he's mm. he's got like a john ham vibe totally does yeah you're right and this someone should put the two of them in the movie as brothers in something that would be great that would be great yeah great show great show mm. Um, really I love, I love that. In. I love that you asked the question about did it have to be gay characters? Because I, I actually was going to talk to him about that because I was thinking gay actors. You mean right? I meant I meant gay actors. Yeah. Because would would straight guys would you have gotten that passion? Would you have gotten that? Would they have gone there? Right. Because they would have been going to a place that they'd never experienced themselves. Yes. And it would just be their interpretation of what it would have been like to have sex with a guy. Yeah, yeah. And these yeah. guys didn't hold back at all. No, I mean, did not hold back. That's as frank as a sexual relationship, as I've a, a gay sexual relationship as I've ever seen on TV. So, uh, okay, let's wrap it. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, Subscribe to the channel so you won't miss any shows and leave us a comment or a reaction. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, subscribe to this channel. Leave us a five-star review. We appreciate that in a comment and all the reviews and the comments and the ratings and all that stuff. Help us with the magical algorithm as we continue to grow the show. So this has been great. Thank you very much. And thanks to Ron Nicewanner. And we will see you next time on the Culture Pop Podcast.